see that long COVID being diagnosed in terms of number of weeks people have these prolonged symptoms. Do you think this is the right thing to do? Because for any other illnesses, we do have biomarkers to properly diagnose the baseline of the illness, the current state, or it's a late stage of, of an illness. And with the long COVID, we are missing that. And we say that if you have 12 weeks or more, you are in a long COVID state. So knowing the acute phase and uh, how the COVID develops after 18 months of being in the pandemic, uh, do you have any ideas and hints how long COVID can be diagnosed? What biomarkers possibly could be used? Okay, so you ask a really good question. And we do have an answer. So I have a, we have a colleague in California who's been studying long COVID and he has he's found the biological signature of long COVID. So basically what he does is he looks at the monocytes in these patients. So a monocyte is a circulating white cell. It's, it's, it's uh, the monocyte when it goes into the tissue forms the macrophage, which is like a garbage collector cell. So what he has found, and it's truly astonishing, is people who've had long COVID and maybe even 15 months afterwards, they have activated monocytes. So these monocytes are activated and they're producing inflammatory mediators, a lot of inflammatory proteins. And truly astonishing what he found in these, in these monocytes is they have spike protein. So we do now, we believe we have a really good signature and biochemical understanding of what long COVID is. So long COVID is because the host has not got rid of spike protein. The monocytes continue to be activated and continue to produce inflammatory cells. So, um, you know, Do Dr. Patterson's developed an assay for long COVID. Hopefully this kind of assay will become more widespread across the world but you know you can look at his publications they're available uh, on, online and in fact in our um uh, in our protocol where we go through long COVID, i do talk about his his really very important research which is now you know allows us to better understand what long COVID is exactly this is really important this is the question why, for example, UK labs are not taking that research and uh, digging down into it. So because, uh, yes, I've read papers of Dr. Patterson, it's a great work and it's a, I think it's a great first step towards identifying long COVID biomarkers. It's just the question is why there are no more labs which are gonna do the same thing because in the UK we're still playing with the time. So if you are not yet 12 weeks, if you are not deteriorating uh, massively, then you're not long COVID sufferer, which is wrong. So uh, that's sort of question for everyone. And Anche, if you could comment on this. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. I think it's shameful that there's so little research being done in long COVID. It's an absolute disgrace. It's such a prevalent disease. And it's, I mean, uh, Dr. Patterson is the only person I know who's actively looking scientifically at these people. I think it's an outrage. I mean, I think that, you know, this is not difficult stuff to do. And we need more researchers doing the kind of work that he's doing. So, you know, as we said, is that COVID is an acute inflammatory disease. It seems when you go into post-COVID is that this doesn't resolve. So I think there are a lot of inflammatory biomarkers that you can measure. And there's no reason that this can't be done. Um, I, th I just think people don't want to look at it because they don't want to know what the answer is. As, as somebody who spent some time in biomarker research, I can tell you that there are some ingrained problems in the field because the majority of the biomarkers which we are using daily, and that includes all the large biochemistry of the blood and everything, they are kind of historically inherited. They already on the big machines and the standard set of analysis has been made. Well, new kinds of tests, at least in the United States, they are put and used through so-called 
lab developed test or LDT model. And this model is very difficult to scale up because they approved for a particular lab like Dr. Patterson lab. And in order for another lab to do the same test, they need to want it and validate it in their lab and then file with the FDA, etc. And majority of the lab just simply don't want to do that. They are making good uh, business already from existing model. So there are systemic problems in this field, and I'm hoping that the whole situation with coronavirus actually will bring change to the field, and we will have more widespread use of novel biomarkers. Like good uh, example would be use of procalcitonin to differentiate bacterial from viral infections. Everybody knows about it, but nobody using it except if patients want it or some particular physician really promoting this kind of test. Otherwise nothing would be done. So there is a lot to work on. And there is a big, big hope that the coronavirus crisis actually will lead to some reformatting of the current ways how we do things. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Dr. Baranova completely. I think that we need to rethink the way we do these biomarker tests because they're very helpful. You know, you mentioned procalcitonin. Procalcitonin we find to be a remarkably useful biomarker in our septic patients and patients with coronavirus. And I think similar biomarkers should be made commercially available. There's no reason that they shouldn't be. You know, we've known about inflammatory markers for 20 years, yet it's just so difficult for us, you know, at the bedside to, have to measure them. It's, it's, you know, I think you're right. This should be an impetus for us to to develop newer techniques to measure biomarkers clinically. Looking into the Delta variant and symptoms that you see now as in ICU patients, do you think Delta can bring some changes to long COVID symptoms? Will it change mm. somehow the pathology of long COVID itself? Can it change due to the variant itself? So that's a good question, which we don't know. So the possibility is because it is such a inflammatory variant that in fact, post COVID may be more common after the Delta than the, the previous variants because you have all of these activated monocytes and macrophages. So we don't know this yet. It's a really good question. But I would predict that post-COVID is going to get worse with this variant rather than better. That sounds really bad, isn't it? Yes. In terms of post-COVID, there are quite many people with neurological symptoms and uh, suffer who are suffering with dysautonomy. Well, we know what, what they are, we know the symptoms, but we don't know how to treat it. Can you give any advice? Yeah, so again, you know, we don't have all the answers, but if you look at our website, we do have a protocol for post-COVID. And Dr. Patterson also has a similar protocol, basically to try and switch off these monocytes. So we now, you know, you first have to understand the disease to treat the disease. Now we kind of understand the disease. So basically you have to switch off the monocytes. And so there are a number of drugs you can use to do that. The neurological problems, I must say, are a little bit more difficult because I think many of these patients may already have structural brain in injury. So it becomes more difficult to reverse. Uh, we recommend fluvoxamine in these people because it does cross the blood-brain barrier. It is anti-inflammatory. Um, some patients don't tolerate it too well, but I think if you increase the dose slowly. So, um, but you know, as I far as we understand, it only works at the day one, sort of in the acute phase. But how does it apply to people who are in the post-COVID phase? Yes, yeah, so basically, you know, there's very similar drugs. You want to use drugs which switch off the monocyte. Um, so, or reprogram the monocyte so it's not pro-inflammatory. So, for example, statins, you know, which are used to treat high cholesterol, are very good at switching off the macrophage or the monocyte. So we include a statin in, in the protocol. 
Ivermectin, which is anti-inflammatory, has a role. Steroids may, may have a role, as well as cytokine blockers. So uh, there are a number of drugs what one can use to basically reprogram the macrophage or the monocyte, because we know the monocyte is the cell that's being activated. So what you want to do is try and deactivate the cell. Ancha, do you have any idea how uh, the monocytes, uh, which are carrying S1 in them, what is the functionality and why they're not dying as they're supposed to die in a couple of days? What is happening? Good question. So, I mean, that is a fundamental question, is, which is part of COVID, is why the monocytes aren't dying. <laughs> Well, I can add a little bit of flavor to that uh, mentioning uh, our own paper, which was, it's not published yet, but it's accepted to publication. And it is uh, uh, simply a GWA analysis, uh, meaning that we looked into the already profiled variants in the human genomes and which variants could be protective and which variants could be uh, providing uh, for the better situation with COVID, right? So it's depending on what kind of outcome you have. You have protective variants uh, and you have uh, the variants which are promoting the disease. And one of the protective variants happened to be in the CCR5 gene. CCR5 is a receptor well known for uh, being a receptor for HIV. And of course, I'm not uh, equating those two viruses. They're totally different viruses. But CCR5 is a very important receptor for functioning of the monocytes. It's not a primary target for coronavirus, but for some reasons, variation, which is defining the level of CCR5 expression in cells, somehow contributing to the outcomes of the disease. And I should say that in the current GWA studies, only outcomes which are used are the hospital outcomes. So it's not about post-COVID, it's about acute COVID. But we are expecting that within the next six months, we will have outcomes for post-COVID. And then we probably will have the whole set of genetic variation present in people, which would be predisposing to the having long COVID tail of the disease or protecting, uh, helping us to like stop the disease at certain point after the virus is cleared. So a lot to study here. But at least we know a little connection which goes through CCR5 receptor. And that is some place where one should start. So you know what, what you say is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating because one of the medications that Dr. Patterson uses is a CCR5 antagonist that's used for HIV. Just because, as you say, CCR5 is such an important chemokine for the monocyte, that he uses the specific drug which is used for HIV for the post-COVID patients, and they do apparently quite well. So I think CCR5 is actually an important uh, mediator, and obviously if you can block it, it, um, it may have an important role to play in post-COVID. Well, that's uh, to start. So I think it would be really interesting to explore it at uh, many levels, both at the level of genetic and at the level of therapeutic targeting. And uh, CCR5 is not the only one. There are other molecules which are overrepresented in monocytes in comparison to other populations uh, of uh, white blood cells. And uh, we should just go one by one and find out what is exactly would be able to stop long COVID without having a slew of side effects. And I think that the scientists and physicians should be working together on that one. We certainly would be able to list the molecules, but they need to be tested in clinical trials, and that is on the side of physicians. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I think we covered quite a lot of topics, and uh, it's it's really a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Marek and Professor Ancho Voronova. So I think we found quite many commonalities between science and what we see uh, in ICU in terms of Delta. So final remarks, uh, if you have any more questions, anything that you would like to raise. Yeah, so I think, you know, people need to take control of their life. I think people need to understand the things that they can do to limit their risk of getting COVID and dying from COVID, that we can't trust the WHO, the NIH, NICE, because they, they have uh, other interests at heart. 
And I think people must be proactive to do what they can do for themselves to improve their health and to reduce their risk of getting COVID. Thank you. So I think we're gonna finish here and uh, it just, in case more research gonna come, we are really happy to bring the discussion on the table and uh, connect researchers so that most important questions are finally being answered. So thank you for your time. And Valentina, thank, thank you, you for your for your for inviting me, and thank you, Doctor Professor Baranova, for a really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you.